Hello, people. To all of our hundreds and hundreds of handsome and gorgeous fans and the three ugly ones, we'd like to say thank you for tuning in to The Everything Store, which is a fantastic book about the story of how Jeff Bezos built Amazon. This is part one. We talked about this so damn long that we had to cut it into two episodes. Uh, so uh, this is the beginnings of Amazon. We appreciate all of you as subscribers. If you've not subscribed, please hit that subscribe button. And if you like our show, please help us share it. Get the word out. You're listening to Let Me Speak to a Manager with Frank Cava and Ian Matthews. What a crack of shit. Yeah, that was a hot mic, Sam. It's 30 minutes away. I'll be there in 10. Do it live! I can, I'll write it and we'll do it live! Frankie! Uh. <laughs> hey, Frank! Uh. <laughs> Clear your throat, bro. Ian, you son of a bitch! We are talking about Amazon today. And what better topic to talk about? We are experts in Amazon because we have 11 boxes on our porch every day when we come home from work. So that makes us experts. This morning before I left the house, I asked Alexa if she was spying on me and um, if she was going to report that we were doing a podcast on Amazon today. <laughs> and I got some stock answer about how uh, that Amazon, we take your privacy very seriously. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure you do, Alexa. Creep it all over me. You just want one of those hockey pucks in every room to get as close as you can. So uh, Jeff Bezos just announced that he is stepping down as CEO and taking an executive chair position to focus more of his time on philanthropy and also on big initiatives for the company. So uh, Jassy, who currently runs AWS, um, which is their pretty much, I think it's now moved to 60% of their net income is coming from um, their AWS division, which is basically outsourcing your cloud to Amazon, which to me seems pretty dangerous. Um, but regardless, that's where a lot of the profit comes from. So Jeff Bezos is out. And one of our favorite books that we have talked about many times is uh, The Everything Store which is the story of Jeff Bezos from, you know, it's pretty much a, pretty much a biography on Jeff Bezos, uh, but it's really the story of how Amazon was created and um, an influential book to say the least. One of the things that I think is relevant to talk about with this, with this book is uh, there's a few things. So I have the book in front of me for those of you listening and not looking at it. This is what it looks like, which it makes for great radio. Um, in addition to that, um, <laughs> Ian put the outline together and then I went through the book and I was like double checking what I had highlighted what versus what he had thought was podcast worthy. And there's about 80% overlap. A lot of the things that you thought were relevant, I thought were relevant, were sharing or was impactful to me as a, a, a business person, a business owner. Um, the other thing of this is how slowly both of us read this book. And we didn't talk about that until today, but this book took me like six weeks. It's 300 pages. Like th I can get through a 300 page book if I'm really focused in a weekend. Um, you know, a Stephen King book you can devour on an airline flight. This is a, th which is the similar length. This book is, it, it, it's kind of like getting an expose into a great coach. And you want to listen, like, oh, how did Belichick do it? Or how did Saban do it? Or how, like, so, so it's that, but it's, but it's someone who's at a pinnacle, who's reached a place that very, very few people have reached. And because of that, you take every word very seriously. It's like, there's some level of stealing. You're getting inside the brain. This is an unauthorized biography. It's really well written, but Bezos didn't sit down in front of a microphone and record this. This was someone just going and scraping it out of other people's heads and putting it together. So it, it's not an illicit look, but it's close to that of being inside someone's brain who has dominated business in the 21st century. And 
it's serious. Like it's not something that's flipping that you just fly through. It's, it's almost like a, it could be a roadmap if you want it to be. And I think you and I both looked at it from that perspective, but this is pretty cool, but it's also heavy. It's heavy. Um, and it's, uh, what we'd like to do with this podcast and it's probably going to end up being a couple of parts because the hard part for me in putting an outline together of the everything store is I, it almost would just become in uh, an audio book. I just read the whole book because there's like a nine hour audio book. There are a few pages that aren't impactful to me. It's wild. It's like you, I could only read about 10, 15 pages of this at a time, maybe 30, 45 minutes because it was so heavy. And I found myself underlining half of what I was reading and taking pictures and snapshots of things everywhere. Um, it's, it's like an MBA course slapped into 300 pages. It's, um, you know, it's a blueprint of how to start out of your garage and become the richest man on the planet. It's really wild. The only places I didn't do tons of underlining is when I talked about his dad, the unicycle riding juggler. I found out that fascinating, but I, I didn't know how that was applicable to my life. Probably wasn't. I mean, if you've ever met me, being on a unicycle is not my best look. It makes you feel even more worthless, though, that, you know, you and I had pretty hard work and good examples of dads who were always around. And this guy had a unicycler dad who left him when he was a kid, and he still did better than us. It's kind of embarrassing. Nurture versus me. We had every advantage. We had every advantage over Bezos, and we let him off the hook. Um, the, the other, The other... For me, another reason why I found myself very engaged in the everything store is um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm involved in a tech startup now. I'm an equity investor, as you are, um, you know, and David, the CEO, and I were building a product and our number one competitor is going to be Ring, who is owned by Amazon. So I found this book an opportunity to really dive into the dealings because they get into a lot of how they compete with people and they are, they are ruthless. They are a cutthroat organization. They negotiate hard. They're tough on people. Um, and there were, for me, I really learned a lot and it was hard for me not to take pictures of pages and send them to David, uh, you know, who's, who's bound and keep and say, no, check this out. We need to think about this or, and, and really started a lot of really good conversations with us. But part of the reason why I'm so focused on this is they are about to become a very big competitor of mine. And that makes sense. And one of the things we did this year that was really cool is we sat in, uh, in my house. I ordered in some food and we had coffee and drinks and I had my leadership team watch the Men Who Built America. And the Men Who Built America in 150 years is going to have Jeff Bezos in it because it's going to build the next America. Yeah. But Bezos, not too dissimilar from a Carnegie or a Rockefeller or a Vanderbilt, dominated. Absolutely dominated. And when the movie that came out that was called The Social Network came out, they said you can't have half a billion friends without making a few enemies. Do you remember that when that movie came out? Yeah. And that's part of this like it's a really cool business story but they put their foot on competitors necks mm -hmm. and they crushed them and what i think is interesting is as harsh and unforgiving and unrelenting as they were towards competitors they were equally compassionate towards customers they were equally as excited about doing the right thing for a customer. And I, I have an example in the notes here somewhere, but like I've spent $30,000 in one sitting on Amazon. Like I bought a bunch of tech and I bought a, like literally just sit down your carts, 30 grand and you hit the button. Like if you didn't have absolute faith in that company, like that's a big, or that's a huge order. Um, and, and without like, ever meeting anyone, without talking to another human. By doing all of it over a computer interface. Like if someone was like transported here from the 50s, they would think you were absolutely nuts. And it showed up two days later and everything was perfect. And it's it's like, it's, in fa it's, it's unfathomable what they've been able to do. But being so competitive, but also being so good to your customer is that weird juxtaposition that just sets them apart. And... This is a Frank, this is a sidebar because you just brought it up. Um, they, they get into the early days of the internet, early nineties. 
Do you remember the first time you put your credit card in online, how stressed you were? I, I, I remember, I don't remember what I bought, but I remember how many people I talked to to say, are you sure my credit card's not going to get in millions of hands around the world? Like, I don't have any money. I can't have people. I was so scared to put my credit card online. And today you wouldn't think twice. Anyone asks, you just give it. So I, I don't have that exact memory, but I have this memory. Remember when Marty McFly ends up in 1955 and he can't figure out how to open a Coke bottle? Like he's like, it just like everything's like, it's no longer the world he's used to being in. Yeah. I remember I came home from work and Nickel had sent me a CD. It was a CD from Metallica and it was at my doorstep with a note. And I remember like sitting there and like pondering what just happened. I'm like, wait a minute. He Nichols like my least tech forward friend in the first place. And secondarily, like this thing shows up with a note at my doorstep. It's like 1998, 99. And I'm like, what the hell just happened? Like, I, I remember thinking like, this is fundamentally very different than anything else. Like, how did, like, I, I looked at it and I was like, how did Jeff pull this off? Like, wow, I, I gave him such incredible credit because it was something so different than what we, that, that life was like then. It's funny. Um, so one last one before we jump in this outline. So when you think about technology that changed, I remember one of the craziest moments for me, and it was also with a very not text sensitive. So the first person I ever received a picture on a phone from was Neil O. He sent me a uh, you know, these were the old flip phones and I, I don't, they were probably like Nokia's or maybe Motorola's, the flips that had the, you had to pull the antenna out and my phone had the ability to send it, but I didn't know how it worked because it was actually really hard back then. Right. I just got a random uh, image of Neil chugging a beer and he sent it to me. And I remember being like, how did you like, what alchemy is this? How did you pull it off? This is nuts. Um, and I remembered thinking to myself, like, this changes so many things. You know, we can send pictures, videos to each other. It just changed communication in my eyes. But anyway, let's get back to the everything store. So number one, the outline early in the book, they talk about this. And I think you just said it. And it's, it's in the whole book. It's you, you can't get away from it is just how nuts Bezos is about the customer. Um, and a, a great, a great quote that he has early in here, one of his Jeffisms. Um, if you want to get to the truth about what makes Amazon different, it's this. We are genuinely customer centric. We are genuinely long term oriented and we genuinely like to invent. Most companies are not those things. They're focused on the competitor rather than the customer. Just an awesome, awesome quote. And he, you know, he goes on to say very few companies have all of these elements that think long term that like to invent and are customer centric, have all three. And throughout the entire book, he proves over and over and over again that he will ruffle any feathers he needs to, employees, suppliers, competitors, industries, to focus on all three of those things. So my notes were incredibly similar to what you just said. They, they, they were just effing relentless with competition, but they were so unbelievably wound up in making sure the customer believed them. And you used a word and it was kind of a throwaway word on purpose, but alchemy, like they were changing. Like if you ever look at a Steve Jobs movie or biography, he's always like, we're, we're changing the world. And I always thought that that was so arrogant. Like you're, you're just putting a computer on your desk. Like I didn't understand how to use an Apple product when it was changing the world to a degree. Like to me, it was just a, like a really expensive paperweight with like a crappy green screen. Like I didn't get it. But it, but as a, as a little kid, but as a as a twenty something year adult, I really realized with Amazon, wow, they are changing the world, and they physically have. Like I was having a conversation this week with somebody and they were talking about how incredible Amazon is like after COVID, like you didn't have to go to the grocery store. Like everything just showed up at your doorstep in a world where we needed to just be locked in houses. Like if we didn't have Amazon, like we would have all gone to hell in a handbasket, but instead like 
just these magical little packages will show up a couple of times a day with all your necessities in it. You know, you know, you'd go outside with your little bleach, you pick it up, you walk inside and then boom, all your sustenance was there and it just magically showed up. But creating that magic, <laughs> it takes a lot of work. Yeah, it takes a lot of work. And, and I think one of the things, it, it makes sense for everyone to say, you know, why can't you be more customer centric like Amazon? Um, and I think in most companies where you work, you're not going to find anywhere near that level of customer um, focus. And the reason is Bezos went a decade without making any money and, and, and not even just not making money, losing extraordinary amounts of money. And Frank and I talked a little bit about this in, in preparation for this, this podcast. I don't, I, it's incredible, but I don't know if there's another decade where he could have started it and done as well, because there was so much easy money. Um, multiple times in the book, they talk about how Jeff was so focused that you would get chastised if you called the company Amazon in the 90s. You had to say Amazon.com because that's the only way he could keep drumming up new money and getting people to invest in the stock or getting new investors because anything that said .com in the 90s, people just threw money at. And I, I, don't, I don't know if in today's world you could lose money that long just by saying .com and get away with it. He got away with it because they were a, a bubble company. He knew what he wanted 10 years, but I don't know if you could get away with people giving you as much money as he needed to create what he created and to be that customer focused and lose money that long. It's, there's three incredible things here. And like comparing myself to Amazon or my business to Amazon is like, it's foolhardy, but 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 I'll, I'll I'll draw parallels. Just give it a shot anyway, Frankie. What the hell? I mean, no one's listening. Any what the hell? No one's listening. Give it a shot, Frank. You and Amazon. I mean, is it a podcast? A twenty first century ego trip, anyways. Like, <laughs> yes. We well, have Ian. We have three hundred and fifty dollars worth of equipment that was all delivered here through Amazon, but that <laughs> qualifies us to have a podcast. Yeah, one hundred percent. God bless America. All right, so customer centric, like that's a huge thing where the customer is always right. And in my business, we try and do that. We build houses, we service houses. We are trying to be customer centric, genuinely, genuinely long-term oriented. We in my business have constantly not taken a profit today to realize that profit later. And what does that look like? We hold houses we could easily wholesale and we keep them as rentals and we make a fraction of that money annually. But the beauty is a decade, decade and a half later, I've got a ton of assets that I'm holding on to that have changed the course of my life and my business's future because we were long-term oriented, not nearly as on the scale or what, what Amazon did. Where we diverge is genuinely liking to invent. And this is one of the themes for me throughout this, Ian, if you look at like the, the people who are the men who built America in the 21st century, I, I think Bezos, I think Elon Musk, I think Mark Zuckerberg, like those are the names that come to mind quickly for me. Like when that television program comes out a hundred years from now, they'll be the ones on it. And Steve Jobs too, um, to a degree. And so too with uh, maybe Bill Gates. But what I think is really unique I get a great performance out of my people. I have awesome employees who give me an incredible effort and work hard. What I am struck by with these type of business books and, and business stories is that when people are like bending the space-time continuum and they're changing the world the way Apple did in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s, the way Amazon did, the way Facebook did, people put in different levels of effort because they realize they're really committed. Like there's, there's huge upside, but there, there, there's something to it. And I can't relate to that because my business is just providing shelter. But when you have that difference and you have that thing that kind of bends the mind, I think you get a different performance out of people. And what he does is he invents and changes. I reap the benefits of that. All of us reap the benefits of those inventions. But I think it's, it, I, I think you can do different things with people 
when you're inventing and you're literally changing the course of history. And I think it gets a different performance out of people. There's a different sense of mission if yes. you're creating the first sustainable yes. electric battery car company. If you're, you know, Musk, I mean, you know, he, look at the people he's hiring in his yes. SpaceX. Look at the brains he's hiring, the intelligence surrounding everyone, what they're trying to solve. Um, if you haven't done it, Frank, go go YouTube where Musk takes, it's like a 15 minute YouTube where he walks you around the SpaceX plant. Oh my God, it's it's un, it's unreal. He created that from scratch. But they, there was, when you talk about pushing people though, because of that sense of mission, Musk just did a uh, conference call in Clubhouse and someone was asking him about his, his health, right? Because the guy has had multiple mental breakdowns. He's, you know, he works, pushes himself so hard. And he was talking about, you know, they were asking him, where do you sleep? You're kind of famously, you sleep in the shop all the time. And, you know, do you, do you have like a conference room that you set up? And he's like, no, I don't want it to be comfortable. When I sleep at, at the factory, I go out on the floor so everyone can see me sleeping on the floor like a bum. I want them to know I'm suffering because I know I'm pushing you hard. I don't want you to think I got some cushy setup. And he's dead serious about this, but that's, if you ask people at Kava companies like sleep here tonight, like they'd be like, go to hell. We're selling real estate, but there's a mission that like we're in a race to change history that people get caught up in. They get excited. And over and over, you hear that in, um, in, in the everything story in the book, they were, he's able to ask more of people because of just how revolutionary the mission is. So I want to ground how revolutionary this mission is. I can't think of a stodgier, slower moving, less adaptive branch of government than the post office. Like mm. literally the post office. Like, mm. it, like, is there one that's stodgy or slower moving or less adaptive? No. And speaking of non-customer centric, like when was the last time you're either at the DMV or the post office? Like talk about a waste of an afternoon. But Somehow, and we're going to talk about this through negotiation, somehow Amazon convinced the post office to deliver not only Amazon packages, but I've had post office trucks pull up to my door on Sundays. I have no idea what negotiation that is, but they got the post office, at least the vehicles, to drive through your neighborhood and drop off a package on a Sunday. Mm -hmm. Like, like for those of you that are young that don't remember that, like that is incredible. Like, it's just taking everything you're absolutely certain of and changing it. Yeah. So Bezos, one thing that I love about books like this is I love following the journey and seeing at one point in their journey, did they diverge from mine? So Bezos, you know, good student, smart student, you know, was recognized. There is, there's as, a divergence. It's, it's, it happened at four. <laughs> yeah, well, recognized, but he wasn't. He wasn't Beethoven. I mean, he, you know, he he was smart and he was recognized as higher average intelligence. But there's millions of kids like that. He wasn't Beethoven, um, but he, you know, was smart. Did get a great job at a hedge fund. Was paid really well performed well, got promoted quickly, was seen as someone with a lot of potential. So when I'm, when I'm reading a book like this, I'm like, ah, I could have done that. I could have got a job at a hedge fund. Ah, I probably would have got promoted pretty quick. I, I probably could have, I might've even been faster at that point, but there's always a point in these books where I go, ah, oh, shit. Yeah, no, I, I wouldn't have done that. There's no way. Uh, so I'm, I'm always interested in where the divergence happens. Um, and it's, you know, I'm also fascinated by how the first five years of your career form so much of who you are the rest of your life and, and how even successful people, Warren Buffett always goes back to his internship with Graham, always talks about it. Like that time, the paper, those, the paper route and then Graham, those few hours in the office, he couldn't even get a full-time job there because he wasn't Jewish. The guy wouldn't give him a job, but it was just like an internship. And he bring he comes back to that all the time because when you're young, everything you learn is so important. You feel like you feel like that first sale you make with a customer, you climbed a mountain. Just everything you do feels more important than it is. 
so I'll have some fun with this first at my own expense. So biographies or autobiographies I've read recently where I have immediate divergence. So like the history of Guns N' Roses or like a, a, a book about like huge rock stars, the lavish parties, the heavy drug use, the incredible women like, all right, I'm out. <laughs> They're not talking about me anymore. That's a completely different, a completely different thing. Tiger Woods hitting golf balls in his garage until midnight when he was four years old. Like, they would, like these are just things that I, I never did. Larry Bird being out in the rain, shooting free throws, um, you know, for hours and hours and hours. Like, there, there's, there's a lot of that. But the foundational skills that are so important. I mean, Ian, I talk all the time about my high school football coach, Outback Steakhouse. And I don't talk about the last seven years at NVR. I usually talk about the first five or six, because those are the things that set the frame for the rest of my life. You and I have talked about this many times. I am much more GE than I am NVR. GE right. in five and a half short years made 80% of the impact of who I am as a manager, a leader, a business person than NVR ever did. And that's not, that's not to rip on NVR. That's not, I liked the culture at NVR. I was kind of who I was by the time I got to NBR and I didn't change a lot. I changed in little ways, but, but not big ones. And it, it's hilarious when you bring that up. I, I can remember sitting with my son on a couch and he was, he was four, right? So just a little guy. And I remember watching a, uh, like a 30 for 30 on Wayne Gretzky, right? So a documentary on Wayne Gretzky and Wayne Gretzky's right. getting an interview and he's like, you know, when, uh, when I was three, uh, you know, I'd get up and I'd play hockey for like two hours before school, eh? And then we'd play until the sun went down. At three. And, and I remember listening to that and being like, oh shit, IJ can't be Wayne Gretzky. He's already so behind. Like, I, I already don't recognize who Wayne Gretzky is. Like, it, some people when they're four years old, are, you start reading the biography and you're like, oh, they passed me at four. They're already better than me at four. Bezos at like 30 is not ahead of me at 30 or maybe 27, 28 is not ahead of me. But quickly after that, he surpasses where I'm at. But he, a lot of in this movie, so this time he spent at the hedge fund, um, his interview process, his focus on finding talent. Um, it's where he started asking a lot of the crazy questions. Like he learned, he would ask people how many fax machines are there in the United States when he was at the hedge fund. And he brought that out to the West coast, um, to the tech industry. And I just, by and large, I hate those stupid questions. If you were shrunk down to miniature size and thrown in a blender, how would you get out? And uh, why are tennis balls fuzzy? Uh, how many fax machines are they? I, my opinion is that's just a uh, interviewer trying to show you how smart they are and not really trying to learn anything. I don't know if you, do you use any of those dumbass questions, Frank? Cause if you do, I'm sorry if I just offended you. No, like I'm a big Zappos fanboy. I met Tony Shea in 2009 and um, it, it's relevant here because Amazon buys Zappos at, at, I don't know, page 300. And Speaking below. of drug induced parties, is that where you met him? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Those blowouts. That's kind of a, that's actually a very sad story. I didn't see that art. But too soon, too soon but, to but rip that joke. One of the things that they talked about was like, you know, they asked some inane dumbass question about manhole covers, but maybe one of the themes that's in this book is they're doing dumb shit. Like this is dumb shit that becomes reality. And because they're doing that, maybe it lines up for them. Maybe it's part of their culture. Maybe it makes sense. For me, it doesn't. Like, I, I don't believe in that question. I think it's dumb. But they're all smarter and richer than us, so may maybe there's something to it. But it's not culturally; it doesn't fit me, and it doesn't fit my business, and it doesn't fit what we do. So we we avoid we avoid those things. But I want to go back to this, Ian. Well, there's also Frank. You know, because Amazon did it, we're all going to do it. But did it really help Amazon, or is it just some throwaway thing? That's you know, th there's a number of those things we're going to get into that are urban legends about Amazon that right. the book kind of undresses and says, well, let's really talk about that. And the other part of it is this, you can mimic who Amazon is and you're probably gonna fail because you're not Amazon and you aren't Jeff Bezos, but you can look at what they've done and you can morph it to yourself. And, and I think like the mission and theme 
besides let's have fun with our podcast is talking about those things, like talking about the things that have impacted us in a way that allow us to get somewhere. But at the same time, the things where you look at it, you're like, yeah, that's just not relevant for me. And um, like, we've been talking a lot about like the Jerry Seinfeld um, podcast the last couple of days, because it's just incredible. And what you realize is how he takes a lot of the noise and kind of pushes it to the side and figures out like how to make sure he's taking care of the things that work for him. What, what, what I want to go into though, Ian, and I want to talk about this is the manhole cover or the fact checking questions are dumb. Like I, if it's smart, call me up and tell me why I, I don't understand it, but this is what I think is incredible. When he was at the hedge fund, he saw an opportunity for an everything store. He saw commodities and understood them and realized that books are a commodity. They're just a commodity. Did he want to be an online bookstore? No. The reason he chose to be an online bookstore is because it was a commodity that, would, that had an inefficient distribution. And he knew that he could change the distribution. He saw that while he worked at the hedge fund. He left the hedge fund to chase after something because he saw a huge item in, in everyday life with a massive inefficiency. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about being somewhere and seeing something and capitalizing on it. We've talked about this multiple times. You worked at GE, they grind you into the ground, but you learn four different business, six different business segments, and then you get an opportunity with a company that doesn't work people as hard, that needed you to learn a new business segment and then basically do what you did five, six times at GE in a new place. And you stood out because of it. For me, I looked at an inefficient business with a bunch of people that run their business out of the back of a truck. And I said, okay, I'm getting into this space. I have a little bit of cash. I can do a lot of what these people do, but I could do it better. That to me is the magic sauce. It's not fax machines. It's seeing where is what you've done giving you a distinct advantage over others and how can you take advantage of that? Yeah, you're, the skill you learned at NBR was scaling, how to grow, how to hire people, how to build a team that can get things done, how to delegate. And that's a skill that 99% of people in the residential real estate market can't do. And so most of them cap out in how much they impact they can make because they can't scale. There's only so many hours they can work in a day where you're very talented at building teams and getting things done through other people. So Bezos... I, one of my absolute favorite things that I took out of this book, and it really impacted me, um, was how Bezos thought about his decision to leave a high paying job. And for the record, when he told his dad, his, it, who's really his stepdad, uh, his dad was a petroleum engineer for Exxon and, uh, told him, Hey, I'm leaving, I'm leaving my job with a hedge fund. Um, and his dad's exact quote was, what do you mean you're going to sell books over the internet? He saw this as a tremendous risk he should not take because his, his stepdad had been an engineer for 30 years at Exxon, same company, stable benefits, right? What worked for him worked, you know, should work for Jeff. And I don't, I don't know how your parents took it, but when I told my parents, I did it after I left NBR. Um, when I told my parents I left, they, they weren't upset. They, they, the look on their face was one of fear. Um, you know, because I, I told them I left it and they knew how much I made at MBR. They knew how much money I had. They knew how much authority I had. They knew everything. Um, and so when I said I'm leaving and I'm not sure what I'm doing next, it made my dad sick to his stomach. He couldn't imagine a 41 year old just stopping without something else and knowing what, and, and I knew I was confident I'll figure it out, but it really freaked my dad out. And so, you know, Bezos, his stepdad had the same exact reaction. I remember when I quit and I did the same thing you did. I quit a couple of days before my birthday and my mom called to wish me a happy birthday. And that's when I told her I had to quit my job. And I remember the phone kind of went quiet and she was a bit scared. And she asked me the same question you asked me, are you okay? 
are you gonna are you gonna like can you afford to live and i assured her yeah like this wasn't I, i've been thinking about this for a long time it happened suddenly but i like i'm done and i, I it, it's the right move but yeah, there's I'm not a, moving i'm not moving into the basement no i'm not coming yeah, you're, gonna, you're gonna tell your parents that I, they live in florida so there's no way i was moving into a basement in florida but even more so than that there's a reason why people who are really good at writing things become commercials. They write commercials. There was a commercial when I was a kid, and it was an American Express commercial. And in the American Express commercial, the older parents, graying hair, have a son who wants to become a musician. And like this was like some kind of a product where they allow you to save money or build for your retirement or whatever. And um, like the kid wants to be a musician and the mom asked the dad, isn't this why we made these decisions in the first place? So the kid could take a chance. They had the money to support the kid, to help the kid go out and do something crazy. And what I think of with this is of course, the parents question it. But to me, what good parenting looks like is instilling the confidence in the, in the children that the children can take that chance. Our parents couldn't take that chance because they just didn't have, they, didn't, they did other things and made other sacrifices for us so we could make the chance. And that's the thing I thought of here. Of course, his dad would ask that question, but it was it, as predictable as it is that his dad would ask that question, it was that predictable that Jeff would leave because he was given the tools to do it. He had the foundation to do it. And we're going to talk about who his first bankers were. They were his parents. Well, that's like, the thing is after his dad got over that initial fear, mom and dad got over the initial fear of, oh my God, you left a high paying hedge fund job. They were the first investors in amazon.com and they were the second investors. They, they, the first two rounds ever were funded by Jeff's parents. And what's interesting is as scared as your mom was, as scared as my dad was, uh, who invested in some of our first real estate deals? My, my second commercial real estate deals, my parents were like, we're in. Like they wanted to get in on the deal just to kind of support me. So did, so did Jenny's, uh, Jenny's parents want to get in on the deal because they wanted to be a part of it. And your dad has invested in multiple deals of yours, and especially early with you. I, last week, we closed out that big um, 75 unit portfolio and I, read, I wrote handwritten cards to all of the people who invested. And I wrote a card to my brother. And one of the things I wrote in there was, you've been with me from, from the beginning. You and dad were there with me from the beginning. 10, 12 years ago, when I wasn't positive that they were going to get paid back, they invested. And it's the other reason that I never went to people outside of family. I just wasn't completely sure. I knew no matter what, I was going to be his son and his brother. So like, you know, I, I could overcome a loss. It's a lot easier to overcome a loss than it is with a friend. And, but, but that's it. It, it, it. There's these things that happen in life, good raising, good environment, stable people produce people who go out and do huge things. And there's another thing in here that comes up a little later about how like people who influence you, your parents like the, the huge influences and they give you the kind of the, the crucible of which to grow. So he, in, in making that decision, so parents aside, the way he looked at it, he calls it the regret minimization framework. And right. I just love this. So um, his quote is when you are stuck in the thick of things, you can get confused by small stuff. I knew when I was 80, that I would never think about why I walked away from my 1994 Wall Street bonus right in the middle of the year at the worst possible time. That kind of thing just isn't something you worry about when you're 80 years old. At the same time, I knew that I might sincerely regret not having participated in this thing called the internet that I thought was going to be a revolutionizing event. Awesome, awesome quote. So one of the greatest joys in my life was giving a toast at my sister's wedding. Um, I blamed it on the fact that, 
you know, usually the brother of the bride doesn't make a toast, but I blamed on the fact that they held their wedding on a Thursday and I just used it as an asterisk in the toast. I was like, I didn't know if you knew this, but the oldest brother of the bride makes a toast on a Thursday because everybody was pissed. The wedding was on Thursday and they had to cut their week short. So it was a funny thing. But like one of the things I talked about is someday when I'm dying, if I'm fortunate enough, I'll have one of these light bulbs go off and I'll think about things. And for me, one of them is clearly around the relationship I have with my sister because she's 14 years younger than me. I didn't have to have that relationship. And I'm so thrilled that I do, but back to business, some of the other relate, some of the other light bulbs that will go off for me all come into the fact that I quit something really secure and built something of my own. And that's what he's talking about here. Steve Jobs had a different way of articulating this, but in his biography written by Walter Isaacson, they talk a lot about this. Like it wasn't regret minimization, but it was like bath. Warren Buffett uses the term the bathrub, the bathtub drain. He just pulls the bathtub drain and it goes down. So he remembers all the good stuff and all the bad stuff just goes away. Whatever it is, we talked about Seinfeld a minute ago, whatever it is, if you accomplish something of, of, of magnitude, there's always sacrifice. And there's always, you're missing out on something. But if you focus on the missing out part, you're never going to get where you need to get because you're, you're going to get pulled in the wrong direction. So you have to have blinders on, in, 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 um, at least in some degree. I have some regrets of businesses that I could have invested in that I didn't. And I, I look back and I think I should have done that. And at the time, what was I spending my money on or what was I doing in business and Truthfully, when you work for a big company, I, I don't know about you, but every year blends together. I can't remember what years I hit my number, what the number was, what we actually accomplished. You, you, th When you're in the middle of it and you're with your team, everyone thinks that you're doing something huge. But I look back, I don't remember any anything really, what numbers I hit, what I did. But you, you do remember the risks you took. So I, I remember... I'm very glad that I don't have the regret that I didn't try something. If I just stayed at GE for 30 years and never left, I would have had regret. And I remember thinking that when I went out to DC, that the money was so different and the opportunity to make money was so different. I remember having those thoughts, that regret minimization framework of, man, are you going to regret that you didn't, that you were scared and you wouldn't be uncomfortable for a while to go just see what you're made of in another company, take all of what you learn and go get it and go take what you think you can go get out of that company. I felt very strongly this regret minimiz minimization pull of, I, if I look back in 30 years, I will regret I didn't take the job in DC and I just stayed in safe General Electric where I was. So, so let me ask this question. And, and I think we don't need to rush through this bullet point. Let's spend some time on it. Um, can you explain and can you recall what it was about leaving Chicago and leaving GE and moving to DC that caused you fear or caused regret or like potential regret? Like, can you, unpack, like you, you talked about, you talked about, yeah. well, let's get into it. Let's talk about it. So the regret I was scared of, um, that would I look back in 20 years and say, you left all your friends. My parents live in Michigan. They were a five hour drive away. Jenny's parents lived in Chicago. All kinds of family in the Midwest, all of our friends, we knew no one on the East Coast. Are you gonna look back and say, man, you, you, know, you left a really, cause we had no kids, we were young. We were having a lot of fun. Are you going to regret the? It was more less about the company, and more about are you going to regret moving away from all the people that you love, and missing those really prime years they go through. And that that's been a challenge for Jenny and I many different times. Of you know, you know, you left Florida, I left Detroit, then Jenny left Chicago. That's that's a challenge. That's. Um, you know, the opportunity wasn't there for me in Chicago and Michigan. The opportunity was in DC and opportunities like I had in front of me just don't come around all the time. And they don't come around in the city that you want it to come in. You could wait a long time and not get anything close to it. So 
So there was the, there was a movie. My, on my worry about the regret would be personally. Okay. I regret the decade I lost with loved ones. So I, I, we're going to get into the, the, the repercussions of that in a second, but let's get them all on the table. So you had the moving away part. What else, did, were you, what else did you look at that could potentially be a regret if you took this opportunity? Sunk cost. Okay. Sunk cost. So yeah. I got five and a half years. I built a name. I have a really strong brand and I'm 27. I've already been promoted three or four times. They took good care of me. I've got to an executive level at a yay, 10 years younger than most people. And I'm just going to go throw away all of that currency that I had. You know, I, it, there was a part of me that was thinking, you've stacked a very big stack of poker chips here. And you're just going to get up and walk away and go start playing uh, craps. You're just going to a totally different thing. You're going to quit playing the game. I had learned this industrial world inside and out. I had learned our products inside and out, engineered, technical, mechanical products. Uh, and I was leaving for a totally different industry, totally different area, no network whatsoever. No one, I knew no one in the company. Um, that to me was something I was like, are you going to regret that you threw away all of that currency that you had built up within an organization and personal brand within the company? Okay, so we had friends and family moving away from security. We have a sunken cost, which is real. What, what were other potential regrets that you went through in your head? And again, when you did this, Ian, when you moved to D.C., you moved to D.C. in what, 2006, 5? 2000, uh, February 2005 is when I started, but we moved there kind of late 2004. Okay, so in 2005, I was 30. So you were 28, 29 years old. 28, yeah. So, I mean, as a 44 year old, you've got a lot of time behind you to, to let these memories and some of the pain fade, but what else? So friends and family, the sunk costs, what were other, some of the things you thought that could be regrets? Um, you know what? One that really worried me was I, I had an engineering degree from Purdue and that is not easy to get. I worked my ass off just to pass those classes and you know, not switch majors halfway through. And I sacrificed a lot towards the end of at least the second half of college, I really bared down, not as much early. But part of me was like, you're, you put all that time and effort in and no matter what happens, you're gonna be labeled a mortgage person. And you know, I, mortgage, you don't need a college degree to be in mortgage. You don't, it's like you're going out to be a realtor. You don't, you, what you do, you don't need a college degree. So the other part of me is you've worked really hard to get into a great company. You have an engineering degree, you are an executive, and now you're going to put on your resume that you are a mortgage person. And to me, they're just, it, it, wrong, right, or indifferent. It, in my mind, it's like, that's not far away from saying you went to sell used cars. It, it's not something that requires much of a background. It's not a very impressive thing to say to people. And, and I can tell you for 13 years, I never once told anyone I'm in mortgage. I, if you asked what I did, I would say I'm a manager at a large home builder. That's it. That's all I ever said to anyone. I would not say mortgage to save my life. My mom barely knew I was in mortgage. I did not talk about exactly what I did. So part of me was are you going to regret being labeled a mortgage person after this? Because that's not who you are. All right. So friends and family, one, sunk cost two, not using your degree is three. And, and going into something, maybe it's, I'm going to use, leave it with not using your degree. What other things did you have to deal with? Those are the three big ones. Okay. Me, really. Those are the three big ones. So this is what I'd like to do if you're cool with this. I'd like to go back and deal with each one of those three. And I want to ask two questions about each one of the three. Question one is how do you feel now about that? And question two is have, so leaving friends and family, I'll, I'll tell you what I mean because I don't know how to ask it in a way that makes a lot of sense, but I'll explain it. And then I want to talk about the callous you develop. And the callous you develop is the skill or something. The calluses are not given. Mm -hmm. They're given as blisters. Calluses are earned. So it means it's a repetitive movement yeah. or it's repetitive skill that, that you deal with. So let's talk about this. Um, I'm going to use 
as the example to really get at the question I want you to talk about is, uh, is this. In my life, I graduate from college with a degree in construction management and everybody goes into commercial construction. I mean, everybody, like 99% of people go to commercial. Sure. And the reason they don't go to residential is residential is looked at as bull crap. It's looked at as, it's not construction. Like everything about it isn't construction. And I had a moment when I was 22 and 23 years old, about ready to graduate from college, where I'm like, I don't want to build structures. I want to build a knowledge and base of business. I want to understand. And then I went to NVR, which was against the grain from all my friends. And I felt like an outcast. Many professors made fun of me. I was in construction and I did well in construction. I threw it. I stopped what I was doing and I went into estimating. I lost all that forward momentum. And I learned like, okay, I'm going to go from being really good at construction. I'm going to go in estimating. And like 90 days goes by and you're not as good as you were at construction and you still suck at estimating because you're just new to the job. So I felt like I kind of felt worthless for a period of time because I wasn't really good at that job. But nine months goes by and I not only did well in that job, I distinguish myself and I get moved backwards again. My salary goes down to like no base and I get into sales. But I rise up again and I build the belief in myself that, okay, this is the third iteration of my career. I get moved back and start over as a manager in construction. I do it again in sales. So for me, the callus is stopping something with forward momentum in your career, kind of deciding against the grain, stopping what you're doing in forward momentum and looking at it from the standpoint of, I may temporarily go backwards to go forward. As a sales manager, I made less base salary than I made as a sales rep because I had the bonus structure was different. Like in a year or two, I could make more, but I knew I had to have a temporary sacrifice to catapult forward. So the question I want you to answer, Ian, is have you used the skill or callus again? For me, that's the callus. So let's go through it. Friends and family. Question one, how do you feel now? So the friends piece, um, it was hard for a few years. But what happens is everyone else gets married. We were one of the first ones to get married. Then they have kids. Everyone is, all of our good friends moved out to different suburbs. Not like they all live on the same block and hang out every night. I go see people and they'll joke. Like I'll ask, oh, how's, how's Edward doing? Or how's Robin doing? Or I'll see some people and they'll say, well, I, I've, I've seen you more this year than I saw them. It's because once you have a couple of kids, you get into different circles. Those circles have to do with your kids, friends, parents anyway. So the friends thing, once you get to a certain age is largely overblown. The family thing, uh, you know, it's still, it's hard for me. I wish I saw my parents more. I wish I saw Jenny's parents more. We love our families. We try to vacation as much as we can and see each other as much as we can. It's not quite the same, um, you know, so that, that's always a bit of a pull, uh, you know, for us. And if we ever moved anywhere, it would not be to a warmer climate. It would be back to Chicago, you know, back, back to near our family to be around them. And, and, and I want to just interject this here. I, it was my 40th birthday. It's about six years ago. And I was spending time with my dad and my dad left his family and he moved from New England to Florida. And in that move, he did it when I was five. So this is 35 years later he had regret, like he missed some of those things. And for me, I found it really fascinating because one of the things I was most happy with in my life is that I grew up in South Florida and not in New England because of the friends I made and because of the opportunities that I had and because I ultimately yeah. ended up going to the University of Florida. It, it, was, it was just so different. So like his regret became my springboard. Mm. Okay. So for you, it's how do you feel now? And then have you used that skill or callus again, kind of leaving something that was important to you, friends, family, and moved into something else? What I can say is um, it gave me a tremendous amount of confidence going from college grad to immediately kicking ass at GE. You know, within a year, I was like, yeah, I'm good at this. I can sell. I, I, I just knew it. He, and, and part of me, 
part of me, the confidence I built at GE, I never really understood the product the way I should have. It was so, everyone was an electrical engineer. I'm not an electrical engineer. I took a few double E classes. I hardly understood how our products worked. And I was still out selling people that could build the product themselves. And I barely knew about it. So I, I knew in my head, you're, this is a skill that you need to ride throughout your whole career is being persuasive and, and selling and marketing. So that gave me confidence. Then I got confidence by, okay, you did that, but you did it in an area that you got your degree in. Can you go to an industry you've never seen before, real estate, home building, and go make a huge impact? And once I did that, Within a year, I was making a big impact at NVR. And, and again, it was the same confidence of, okay, you know, the skills you learned at GE, you can replicate anywhere. Um, so for me to leave NVR, again, that callous, I knew I would be fine. I knew a number of things in my head. I knew no matter what happens, if I ever need to go find a job, I can find a job and I'll go kick ass somewhere. That's... I, I felt confident. I know how to go into a big fortune 500 and turn a team around. I can do that over and over. Did I know I'd be successful with commercial real estate? I knew I'd be successful with five on four group or writing or anything else I'm doing. I wasn't sure, but I, I think when you talk about a callus, I wasn't scared. I wasn't, when I left, I wasn't scared. Um, and you know, the, the regret of having mortgage on your background forever, uh, that was really overblown. That, that has, I don't think anyone looks at me, maybe a few people from the old company might look at me and say mortgage guy, but I think I've done enough now since I've left and since I did before where I don't have some stigma that I'm any one industry. I think, you know, I, my mindset is I can be whatever the hell I want to be and do whatever I want to do. So, so like our goal with this thing is to talk and have fun, but it's also hopefully to educate or tell stories about things that we had to overcome and hopefully you can relate to them if you're listening, right? So what I think is relevant about this particular theme is I was embarrassed to go build these crappy little Ryan homes, but I learned 12 or 24 months later, people had forgotten where I had gone to work in the first place. They didn't care about me. They cared about themselves. And one of the things you and I talked about last week and we were just having fun shooting the crap was you were never a mortgage guy. Even though you are more, you're dealing with mortgages, mortgage guys didn't get invited to the annual meetings. Mortgage guys, nobody cared what they had to say. Mortgage was a dead part of the business. Ian was this guy who was working in mortgage, who was so much more than mortgage. So what I think is really important if you're listening to this is this, we all have fears. We all have things we're afraid of. We all have things that we think, oh my God, this could be the, the biggest regret in my life. But what happens is a little bit of time goes by and circumstances change anyways. And you got to be a little bit selfish to pick what's best for you. And everybody makes that decision. And that's why things drift apart. The friends and family thing is real, especially with the, the family part, and especially as your parents start to get older. But I would argue, Ian, if you were in a, the wrong job, you wouldn't have the flexibility you have to spend a week or 10 days with, with, with your in-laws or with your parents the way you could now. You can do things and create memories like going to the World Series with your dad that with the wrong job, you couldn't have created that. You created these incredible things that they're different. You're not at the house every Sunday, but you've created these incredible flashbulb moments by making these sacrifices. And that's why I wanted to stop on this for a minute, because I think anybody who does anything of note or significance or anybody who really looks back in their life and doesn't have regret is fearful that you're going to have this regret hurdle. And if you don't get over it, that's where the real regret is. The real regret staying on the other side, not jumping over it. Because when you jump over, it's just something you jumped over. It's in your rearview mirror and you're doing other things. And I want to pivot it back to Bezos because that's what we're here for and talk about with Amazon. He learned very early, I have to let things go and move on. And I think his callus came from the fact that he learned that. People aren't doing great. I'm going to cut them. Segments of business aren't doing great. I'm going to cut it. Hey, we're doing incredible. I'm going to self cannibalize us to get into something else because he didn't want to have the regret or the not, not have the opportunity. 
And that's what it comes from. It goes it, to me. I don't know. I'm, I just read a book. But if I looked at it, like that was the first move, leave something comfortable and do something uncomfortable. And he constantly did things uncomfortable. And that's why he'll probably die the richest man in the world because of the fact that he did something uncomfortable and embraced it and didn't do it once. He built a callus and did it many, many times. I think there's one thing that I'll just add to is, um, and I think it comes back to Jeff's parents and some of the things that we've talked about. Um, to, to have success, you can talk to people, but you just said it and I said it too. We both left NVR without telling our parents. We notified them that we did that. Damn, I, I, Jenny knew I was close, but when I did it, I made that decision myself, right? I told her I was close. I, she knew it was coming. One day I came home and said, I'm out. Here's how it went down. She was like, what? And I'm like, we're going to be fine. You, Jeff Bezos over and over and over was in rooms with people saying that won't work. His own people, his S team over and over, that won't work. We can't do that. We can't go digital books right now. We can't. We can't go create a bunch of server farms and start AWS right now. We can't, that's not possible. You can't make a digital book that weighs less than a pound that can download songs that the technology's not been invented yet. He was always in rooms with people saying he couldn't do something. And he just, you have to have conviction to make those decisions yourself. And you have to believe in yourself. You can't, if you think you can just ask enough people and the answer materializes, at some point you got to have the guts to just go make a decision. And that, I know that that's how it's been for you in your life, but it's certainly been that way for me that the big decisions I made, I made them on my own. I made them without counsel. And I just said, you know what? I believe in this. I'm going to do it. I, I, I just finished reading um, the biography of Arnold Schwarzenegger. I finished it last weekend and it's incredible. It's so crystal <laughs> <laughs> maybe not the quote I would have, I would have led with, but, uh, <laughs> but one of the things that was so cool about that book is he grew up in the public eye. Like if you look at business success or money, Bezos is clearly on a different level than even someone like Schwarzenegger. It's probably worth a couple of hundred million, but what's really cool with it is it was huge dreams it was the same pattern it was like get get absolutely famous weightlifting which was weightlifting back then was about as popular as like frisbee throwing is now like we take for granted like he built an industry around himself then he got into movies and he can't even speak english and then he like marries into american family royalty and then and i'm stealing some of this from bill burr and then he gets into politics like he did four incredibly different things. He was in politics in a state he couldn't even pronounce. It's fascinating. But you look at all those little things and those successes and those huge, huge leaps. And it all comes from everyone has the, the fear. They got to get over that hurdle. And then you just have to have self-belief. You got to do it. It, it, it. Anybody you look at and any biography you read, the reason that biography was written is because that person looked at regret straight in the face and said, I'm going to do this in spite of it. And I'm going to get better because of it. And they got on the other side of it. Love it. So there are a number of scenes in the book early where they talk about the creativity of startups out of necessity. And one of my favorites um, early on. So retailers, Amazon wasn't big enough and they didn't have the volume and Amazon Bezos very much wanted anyone to go to Amazon and pick any book ever written and Amazon ship it to you. Well, they didn't have, in the early days, they didn't have distribution centers. So they didn't even have these books. So they would have to, they would take the order, then they would place the order with a retailer who would then ship it. So it took a while and they had to eat a lot. The reason why Amazon didn't make money forever is they didn't have distribution. Right. Um, so the way they'd get around this, retailers required that you order 10 books at a time. Um, and Amazon didn't do that. So they would get, Amazon would get an order for a book. And then what they would do is they would go to the retailer, they would order that book, but then they would order nine copies of some obscure book 
Um, you know, they, the one they used before is one about Lichens. And the retailer would send the one book with a note saying, sorry, we're, we're out of the other book that you ordered nine of. And then they would get their money back for that. So they played that game for a couple of years just to be able to stay afloat. And I, I just, I love the, it, it's making me think of a couple of things that happened this week with our little technology startup. Um, we're trying to figure out some splash moments. How do we get some press? How do we get, how do we get some uh, attention in the funnel? And so Gary V, Gaynor, Gary Vaynerchuk is a guy that, uh, that Frank and I both follow. He's, if you're in social media at all, he's, he's impossible not to see. He's omnipresent, he's everywhere. But um, we've been talking about, he has his own Vayner Media. He has a media company, a marketing company. And uh, we can't exactly afford him yet, but uh, we did a bunch of research and he does this little two-day marketing event. He calls it 4Ds. And so David and I, a year ago, signed up for this long before we raised any money. It's $12,000 per seat. So we spent $24,000 on this. Um, we went and hired a film crew that was going to come film us talking because Gary comes for an hour. So we were going to get to lunch and we really wanted to be able to put a device in his hand at lunch and get it. But the pandemic came and all the in-person stuff got canceled. So they've had our money for a year. and We've just been chilling because we're like, we're going to get Gary V talking about our device. To, we're just making this happen. And so I've been kind of weaseling around and so is David. And we've gotten to know a whole bunch of people in Sasha Media and Vayner Media, And uh, we have convinced them that we will, you can keep our money. We'll do the digital format, which is only $4,000 but we want time with Gary V and we want to be able to record it. And so we just had a call with them this week and uh, we, we have them agreeing that Gary V is going to install our car alarm in his car. He gets car service. It's going to be like after dinner time and uh, 15 minute recorded zoom call after he uses our device, he's going to give his thoughts and opinions on how he would go market the product. It's expensive. It's, but it's not a Hail Mary. It's even if it's only 15, 20 minutes of, of, you know, good video of Gary V it's get close to the sun. It's try to be creative because Gary V costs like a hundred thousand bucks to hire as a consultant. We don't have, it's our way of getting him in the mix. And the other story I have is, um, uh, David has, has, um, donated to the boys and girls club of Atlanta multiple times. And he found out late in the game of a uh, auction that had been going on for two weeks. He found out like 72 hours before it was closing that Shaq was one of the people you could bid on to get an hour with. And he put like a little bid in like 1500 bucks early and sent it to me. And it was like, what do you think of this? And I'm like, Shaquille O'Neal, like our, our, our tech company is a car alarm and Shaq is the most famous police officer in America. He's like a off duty police officer. I'm like, for millions of reasons, we need to get that. We need to win this bid. I don't care what it, Dave, Dave. And he's like, well, when you say whatever it takes, what number? I'm like, well, I would go up to 10 grand. This is when we were like 1500. And so we bid and we bid and we bid. And then David just went quiet. And I'm like, oh, we lost the bid. Of course we didn't get Shaquille O'Neal. What was I thinking? And in the morning he sends me a screenshot, you know, saying you won the bid. It was Shaquille O'Neal smiling. So we had to go through an auction for a charity to get an hour with Shaq. We're going to bring a video crew. We're going to try to use it to get a ton of attention, but it just, these are the kind of things that you have to do to be creative, to get attention when you're a startup that, you know, Amazon couldn't do what Amazon wanted to do by ordering 10 books. Every time someone ordered one, they would have went out of business. So they would order a book on Leachins and they would send nine of them back that's the way they got around it. So I thought that was pretty fascinating. I'm glad my wife isn't here because I'm not sure if it's leachins or lichens. It's kind of like leechins, when I was reading- Lichens, lichens. I don't even know what they are. They're like proteins, I think. It's kind of like when I was reading a book to my son and my wife would always giggle. I'm like, what? And she's like, his name isn't Lemur. He's a lemur. I'm like, <laughs> I went there. All right. <laughs> I didn't even know that was a thing. But to talk about creativity, um, I'm in real estate and what I see people do to be creative is they just, they just commit fraud. 
like they'll buy thing as a non-owner occupant because that's the way to get inventory because they don't know how to get inventory. Um, the creativity comes down to just being smarter and thinking about things. Like there's a part in the book when Bezos wants to buy Zappos. And I love Zappos. I met Tony Shea and I met uh, Gary V at an event in 2009. And they were both like, you know, very, very niche. Nobody really knew who they were yet. Gary maybe had done 300 episodes of his uh, Wine Library TV. And this story that's in the book, Bezos gets absolutely pissed at everybody at Amazon because Zappos, who's a shoe company back then, had the bins at LAX at Los Angeles International Airport, they had put on the bottom a Zappos ad. So everybody who, when you put your shoes into the bin would mm -hmm. see about a company who was a shoe company. Like you're putting your shoes on top of an ad for shoes. And Bezos got pissed because- They're out thinking us. Exactly. And that is what comes from hunger. I, I wanna talk about this a little bit, Ian, and, and, and this is really cool. So I've been a member of a mastermind group now for 10 years uh, or damn near. And I started off as a member and I'm on a leadership team. And I used to come home from the mastermind group and I used to have three or four pages of notes and my business would change meeting over meeting over meeting because I was getting new ideas and there were fundamental differences. I go now and I get a handful of notes. Now I'm not diminishing the power of the mastermind. It's the opposite. My business is no longer a jet ski. I've got a, at a minimum, I've got a boat. I don't have a huge yacht or a, like a cruise liner, but I've got a bigger business. Got a bit of a cabin, got a bit of a cabin to go down to probably yeah. sleep on it if you needed to. I mean, I've got 30 employees. Like we're not as dexterous as we were eight years ago. We're just not. So I come home with bullet points and ideas, but my bullet points and ideas always come from young, hungry businesses that have no money. They're all figuring out guerrilla strategies that work. Yeah. And now I've got the benefit of- And they can't afford to take, to throw money at something and lose easy. So they have to be scrappy. I spend between 20 and $30,000 a month advertising on television. They can't afford that. Television is an incredible investment and it brings huge deals and leads. But what they do is they use effort. So what I get is the ability to have these scrappy upstarts who have to use guerrilla techniques. And then I get to bring it home and I have a whole team that we get to implement it. Mm -hmm. That's what's really cool. And I think that's one of the things that you were talking about a minute ago with, with Amazon. They're ruthless in stealing ideas from people. and they, they implement it in a way that your cool little idea gets neutralized because they do it on such a huge scale. But that is something that the creativity of Amazon, it started with the book where they wouldn't get the other nine copies, but it, 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 it still manifests today. And I want to read this quote. This is right out of Bezos's mouth. Um, it's on page 46. I'm going to read it because I have it right here. Um, He talks about how you can work long, hard, and smart, but not all three. And he changes his tune and he says, look, at Amazon, we're going to do all three. We're going to work long, we're going to work hard, and we're going to work smart. And that is what has changed them and caused them to continue to iterate. The other thing I took here, Ian, was affiliate marketing. Do you know, can you explain what affiliate marketing is? So affiliate marketing is, um, let's just take the most basic example. Let's say I write for a blog and let's say in my blog somewhere, I say, I really love using my uh, Yeti blue microphone on the podcast with Frank and I put a hyperlink on it and I send that to my my list of a couple thousand people and anyone who clicks on it and goes there I get a piece of money. So it's a way of advertising by using your brand and your voice um, to generate incremental revenue. Right, and, and you pay, you get more sales and that person, the affiliate gets a, gets a small cut. Mm -hmm. 
And what Amazon did is this is not a new idea, but what they did is they proliferated it through the internet and it became something huge. It, like this was early 2000 by you know 2020, by the third decade of this century, like this is everywhere. These are real businesses. People are making money just as affiliates. Just people, as affiliates. You're just middlemen. That's all you're really doing. That's it. People are making money on all of Amazon. They're, they're leveraging everything Amazon has done and they're turning it into small little Not shipping, right? Just play in the middle. You know, it's, it's, it's an arbitrage game. You buy low, you sell high, you ship in the middle, you use Amazon to move it. And, and it's so Amazon's creativity created market, a market differentiator for them, but it's gotten so creative. They built entire businesses and it's so incredibly crazy. Now there's people who are literally just making businesses off of something Amazon invented and they're just redoing it in one small niche and they're collecting a little bit of a fee and it becomes a business. It, it, it's just fascinating. So one thing that, you know, if you're starting a business, anyone can start a business and freelance a little bit and make money without a lot of extra work. You just got to be good at adding value and asking for business. But to really grow, to really scale something, you're probably going to have to raise money um, if, if you want to do it with any speed. And I find it's wild looking back on it. So when Bezos was first raising money, so his first, his first fund that he raised that was outside of his dad's family trust, um, he was raising money in 1994 for a company that had a balance sheet that was negative. It was debt ridden. They had lost $52,000 in 94 and they were on track to lose 300,000 in 95. So not only were they losing money, they were accelerating their losses. He told investors based on all that, that he expected 115 million in sales within five years, if things went well. Um, it, uh, side note, he said 150 million, his actual net sales in 2000 were 1.6 billion. Um, but he valued the company at 6 million for his first funding round. And he had to go to 60 potential investors to go raise $2 million uh, for, for you know, something valued at, at $6 million. And, and what he told all of these investors in every meeting um, in the pitch decks is we have a 75% chance of failing. He would tell them all that. And that's probably why he had to go to 60 is a lot of them said no. Um, and as we just did a, a $4 million round for Keep, our, our tech company. I'll bring that up again. And we, we valued that. We valued the company at $16 million. Um, and it's interesting. Some people invest with you because they just don't have anything with high upside in their portfolio. They've got a lot of money and they don't have anything like this. Some people do it because they're bored of stocks or real estate or something else they're doing. Some do it 100% because I'm doing it you know, because I'm putting my money into it. They think, okay, well, you've made good decisions with your capital. If you trust the CEO, then I trust him. Sounds pretty good. Some really like the idea. Some are a pain in the ass. So, um, you know, I have one investor who was like, how in the world can you raise $4 million and value a company at 16 when you've not even sold a product? You don't even have a product for, I couldn't even buy it on your website today. And so to me, these tech companies to invest in, to have invested in that first round, you did very, very, very well. Uh, all the people that invested in that round got very rich. Um, but looking back, you know, when you think about it now, you're like, of course you invested in Amazon, but the time he had to go to 60 people, most of them said no. And he was losing money by a lot and hardly selling anything. And he was, still was raising money at the same time. And, uh, you know, to me, I just, I find it all of the, all of the biographies that we love about people starting companies are always chasing money, bankers, worrying about debt payments. It's just part of life of a startup. So I, I'm going to tell you a funny story here. So, um, Nichols wife introduced me to a girl who lived in, um, uh, Nicholas Frank's best friend from home. Yeah. We talk about Nichol a lot. Um, he's one of our first listeners and usually catches our, uh, our editing errors. So Nichols wife introduced me to this girl, um, who lived in Manhattan and she was a sweetheart, but it was like, she hadn't solved money. Like it was always a problem. 
And um, it just so happened on this one particular day, she was at like, you know, a flea market, which they have in New York all the time. And it turns out on that day, that Banksy, you know, Banksy is Ian. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, clown artist that goes around and kind of just paints stuff and then leaves. He's one of the world's most prominent, either pranksters or graffiti artists. Yeah. And he's talented. He's got cool stuff and his pieces of art go for hundreds of thousands of dollars to millions. And on this particular day, this girl, the story broke and this girl that I was dating, she was like, she was so pissed that she didn't buy one. But Banksy had this old man sitting at a flea market and he was there for eight hours. And one little lady came in and bought two Banksy's for 60 bucks each. And she haggled on the price. They were a hundred dollars each and they were, and she haggled it down to $60 each and walked off and they had a hidden camera the whole time. Like nobody knew they were Banksy's and they, they, they march off. And it turns out that this for 120 bucks, this lady just probably bought a quarter of a million dollars worth of art. And the woman that I was dating was furious that she didn't buy it, but that's the point. Everyone was furious. They didn't buy it. Like nobody, like he pranked them. And people would show up months over months over months and years later, hoping the God that like Banksy would show up and sell pictures for 60 bucks because it was their lottery ticket. Like no shit. People missed Amazon. Everyone missed it. Like the, for every person, all the people who invested, the, they give them the, the money. They probably invested in a bunch that went belly up because that's kind of how it works. It, 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 you're catching lightning in a bottle. One of the things we're going to talk about at the end is what Warren Buffett thinks about investing in Amazon. I'm gonna relate it to this. I just had a bunch of deals come across, um, come across my desk and it was gonna require cash. And when you're in real estate, you don't always have the cash. So you go out and raise what's called equity. Ian has done this several times. He's done it on deals with me. Um, but it feels every time when you have this, that you've got to go out with your tin cup and you got to rattle your tin cup and you got to ask people to give you money. And there is nothing more humble, humbling than asking for money. Like I've been at this over a decade. I've got an incredible track record. I've done it. But you talk about like what it takes to be the difference between a hobbyist and a pro. When you raise money, you're a pro. When you raise money collectively, like consistently, and you've got to have belief where even like in Amazon's early days, there was a 75% chance it would go belly up and he still had the conviction to get people to give him the money. And that's the difference between being someone who's a hobbyist and someone who is, who is not. And it's, um, Frank, it's, it's incredibly hard not to take it personal when someone says no. So it's, you know, that, the, the just finished this raise. This is very close to me for a tech startup, right? It's very different than real estate. If I go raise money for real estate, I, I'm usually talking to other people that understand real estate, that understand the dirt, the zip code. I, I know if my tenant falls apart, I know if the revenue is not completely there, we know there's at least a, a, a floor on the investment that is the dirt, the land, everything else that's tied up in it. But the tech startup, the floor is you lose everything. That's not real estate. That's not ever real estate. You're going to get something back. Everything's going to be worth something. Um, and so it was interesting when we first started, one of the, David and I said, okay, let's go start raising money. Let's go do soft raise. Let's go call some people, start, start making some phone calls. And this is literally how it works. You, it starts with a text message. If you want to know how to go raise $4 million for a tech company, it starts with text messages. Hey, I'm getting into my next thing. It's a tech company. It's going to be a car alarm. It's think about an Alexa for the auto. You interested in hearing more, right? And then you get a little text back saying, yeah, I'm definitely interested. Send me the deck. Then you send them a link. Then that becomes a couple more texts. Then conversations happen. Well, David, so I started with my normal crew of people that I invest in real estate. I start putting some things out and I started getting some pretty good return feedback right away. And uh, David went to a few people of his and he went to an old friend of his and he spent a ton of time with him. And at the end of it, the guy said, I think I... Our minimum investment was a hundred thousand. 
at the end of it, the guy said, I think I could put 10 in. And it really bugged Dave. Dave took it personal, right? He's having a conversation with me. He's like, he can't see it. He can't. And, and he even said to his friend, like, do you not believe in me? And I think that that line is important, Frank, because we're talking about a product, a market segment, right? It's a car alarm. It's a, how are we going to ship it? How are we going to manufacture it? How are we going to market it? But at the end of the day, that small investment that he was only willing to do told David he didn't believe in me. And that's what, when you're starting a business, when you're losing money like Bezos, the people that invested in Amazon, Frank, had to have just liked him. Like this guy, this guy's got some fire because you're not looking at the numbers of making a rational decision. My friend who said, you don't have one sale and you're valuing this at $16 million. He wasn't buying it because he thought the product was sexy and he liked the images I showed him. He was buying it because he'd known me for 20 years and he wanted to invest with me. And if I was in it, let's go get in it. it it's totally, it is such a personal thing when someone says, I'm not interested or I can't do this one or I'm not every time you shouldn't be personal. It's business, but it bothers you when someone says, no, I'm out. So we were talking about, you know, our fantasy camp is someday being a fraction as popular as Tim Ferriss of the podcast. And he interviewed Jerry Seinfeld. And one of the things that Jerry Seinfeld said is it's the setbacks. Those are life's real gifts. Like you do take it, you do take it personally, but I will tell you this, Ian, I had an internship in college and I was thinking about going and working for the company where I had my internship. And I really didn't like the company or the direction of it. It was not where I wanted to go, but I had a loyalty to them. And I had heard that the company had gone through some hard times since I had left, but I did a great job as an intern. I got a bunch of praise and I, I sent the owner a handwritten card and I sent him my resume. And this mf -er, sent me back my resume and it looked like he took a red, like it was like almost like a red crayon mm. and wrote not hiring and mailed it back to me. I got 13 job offers coming out of college. The only thing I have left is that one that said not hiring. That dude went on a business and I was never happier for someone's failure. And the point of this is in anything you do, you are going to reach a point where people don't believe in you. And it could either kill you or it can cause you to continue to grow. And self-belief is such a big part of all of this success. It's self-belief. We talked about you moving out of Chicago. It's self-belief in raising money. It's you did say in real estate, you usually have something, but there is speculative stuff in real estate that doesn't work out. And sometimes you got to raise money for that. Like it, it's, it comes down to, if you can't get repetitive cash in a business, you don't have a business because it will go, I mean, Amazon prints money and they still needed money. So this happens. You and I have talked about this multiple times. The book Shoe Dog, which is basically the upstart years, the first 20 years about Nike, they were constantly on the hunt for money. You have to do it. And this is a rite of passage. I am the owner of my business. Even my number two, I've had some in the past. They don't understand it like me. They don't understand how close to the edge we get sometimes because of the need for cash. And it's something that can't be replaced. The person who comes in as Amazon's number two CEO is never going to have to deal with this problem. Getting a salary, right? Who's getting a salary, who right. has benefits, who is not worried about their reputation because they came in later. Um, every single person I asked for 100000 from Frank, I think about every day. I I asked them for that money. The deal we did in, in Richmond, did the 75 deals, I thought about it every day. You knew my anxiety. When you raise, it's a different level of stress, anxiety. And, and, and if, you're not, if you're not capable of making a compelling pitch, of, of telling a compelling story for what that capital will be used for and what the appropriate return will be,
You're not getting. You have no business doing the deal in the first place. There's there's two things I want to talk about before we move on to something else. One is about just general, and then one goes back to Amazon specifically. We did a deal. We raised two million bucks. I was the biggest investor. Ian thought it would be helpful for the other investors if I had skin in the game and I was, you know, I was treated in a way where I get my money out last because of the structure of the deal. And it was fair. And that's what we did. But I had everybody else's name written on an index card that I carried around for the 13 months that deal was going on. And I always wanted it with me. I always wanted to remember who they were, how much they were in for. And I wanted to be able to, like I, I committed it to memory eventually, but I wanted it with me. And what I will tell you is this, I come across people all the time and they're like, we need cash. I need to raise money. I need like, nobody wants to come out and say, I need cash. But they always say, I need banking relationships. But what they're basically saying is I need cash. And the only thing I can tell you that if you're in a business that needs to raise cash, you need to treat other people's money better than you treat your own money. 100%. If a deal is going sideways, and I've had, I mean, I've done, since I've been in business, I've done, I don't know, it's definitely north of a thousand deals, probably north of 2000 at this point. I've had a handful that I've gotten bloody on. And the last person to ever hear about it's the investor or the bank. The last person. I have not paid myself to pay others back. I have taken money away from future to repay money. I've always repaid every penny of debt with exactly the amount of interest it was supposed to get. And that is what builds a successful career of raising money is you make sure those investors are taken care of. That, that's it. Um, I want to get into something different with Amazon specifically, but is there anything else you want to weigh in on, on with this subject? Nope. I mean, and, and Ian, you and I have talked about this. I've raised somewhere between 50 and a hundred million dollars. Some of it from the same people that I've turned it. It, it, you must, must treat other investors' money in a way that is, they got to get it back or you're not going to be in business. It's you just, can't raise money without a good reputation. That's it. It's, it's critical. So uh, back to, to, to Amazon and Bezos. I think this is really crucial. We talked earlier about him leaving and not collecting that bonus. We talked about him getting out and getting in front of it and participating in the internet and doing it then. One of the things that I found incredibly fascinating about this book is he did a capital raise in 98 and 99. When did the tech bubble pop? 2000. Exactly. Had he waited eight months, he may have been too late. He might have missed it. He mm -hmm. might have raised the money after the tech bubble burst. He raised a ton in 98 and 99. And he had all this money in his coffers when the tech money, when the tech industry popped, two things happened. He had the money so he could grow, but he also could live. There was things that he needed to resuscitate and keep the business alive, but he was able to raise cheap, cheap, cheap debt on time and early. And, and he did it when he knew things were frothy. Right. He, he, he saw that this can't sustain. I'm going to go get as much money as I can and build up. And that's, it's getting frothy now. I don't know if it's this year, if it's in two years, three years, but anyone who's not going out and putting themselves in a good capital position the next few years is going to wish they had. Number one on my goal list for 2021 is exactly this. It's we, We've got debt is cheap. We've got a ton of assets. Position them right. So we have built the boat and built a moat around us that we can withstand anything. And, and, and that's what we're focusing on. But I'm going to tell you a cool story. There's a guy who's in the mastermind group who, um, who lost his job in the last downturn. I don't remember the exact year. But the way that the company structured his, um, his severance was they were going to keep him on the payroll and keep him on health insurance for like 90 days. So instead of calling his wife and telling his wife that he lost his job, the first thing is he did is he went to three banks and got lines of credits from all three banks before he was unemployed. That's great. Or he needed it. And I always listened to that advice. And I was like, that's incredible. And what I did for the last 10 years is I just built chips and I had little places where money could come from. And I made sure every one of my, my creditors 
had been paid back. And when Corona was starting, like Trump spoke from the White House on March 11th. I was in California. On the 12th and the 13th, I was on the phone with my office manager and bookkeeper. I was on the phone with my bankers. And I was like, we've got, it was around 800,000 bucks. I'm like, get all of it. By Friday, it was all in my account. Like from Wednesday to Friday, because I knew we might need it. And the other thing I did is I called up my biggest private banker and I said, look, we're, we're okay, but I need you to help us. And I need some more cash just in case. If I don't need it, I'll pay it back, but I want it now before things get crazy. And that's what Bezos did. He didn't hesitate. He got ahead. And if you're a small business, your business can die. Money is the air that keeps businesses alive. And if you don't treat it incredibly seriously, it will kill you. So paying people back, being proactive, getting ahead, doing these things, I'm telling you, the, the, the market repeats, this is going to happen again. Hopefully it doesn't happen soon, but it's going to happen again. Be prepared. And the time to be prepared is before the rain. Noah built the ark before the rain. Listen to that advice. Love it. That wraps up part one of the Everything Store story of Jeff Bezos building Amazon. If you liked what you heard, be on the lookout for part two, which is every bit as juicy and as exciting. If you like our show, hit subscribe, help us get the word out, share it with your friends. And if you haven't given us that review at Apple Podcasts, it would mean the world to us. What you just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things I have ever heard. Everyone in this room is now dumber for having listened to it.